Hi, welcome to The Reason Stream. I'm Zach Weissmuller, joined by my colleague, Liz Wolf. Hey, Liz. Happy to be here. Former President Donald Trump has four separate indictments hanging over his head at this point. Uh, he also leads the presidential Republican primary field by a long shot in the polls and is polling neck and neck with President Biden. Most recently, he pled not guilty in the case originating in Fulton County, Georgia, which, of course, generated this now iconic mugshot. It is safe to say now that whatever the outcome, it's going to be ugly. Partisans on both sides have rather predictable positions on the Trump prosecutions. But on this show, we aren't partisans. We're skeptics of government power, vigilant about the threat of authoritarianism wherever it originates, and the direction from which those threats originate, I'm sad to say, are many these days. So joining us today to help assess those threats and determine the best path forward from the perspective of those of us who believe our country is at its best when government is limited to securing our liberties and government officials are held accountable for their misdeeds is Ilya Soman. He's a law professor at George Mason University the Simon Chair in Constitutional Studies at the Cato Institute, and a writer at the Volek Conspiracy, a legal blog that's hosted at Reason.com. There and elsewhere, he's argued forcefully for the prosecution of Donald Trump for his actions following the 2020 presidential election, and we'll get into those arguments very soon. Ilya, thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. We're going to focus on the election interference cases and put aside the Stormy Daniels case and the classified documents case for the purposes of the stream. And we are live today and we do plan to take audience questions if you have them. So start putting them in the chat if so. But let's start with a discussion of the Georgia case since it's the most recent filing and in many ways it's the most expansive case. What are the key differences in the Georgia case, distinguishing it from the federal Trump, uh, Trump indictments? There are many differences, but I would just focus on a few of the most important ones. Uh, one big one is that the Georgia case, unlike the federal case, features 18 additional defendants besides Trump, uh, which includes some very familiar people like John Eastman, who were key figures and well-known people in the sort of national conspiracy to overturn the election, but also a number of sort of local Georgia figures that at least up until this point I had not heard of, and I bet most of our listeners also had not heard of. So that's a big difference. It makes this case more complicated and more sprawling than the federal one, though it is likely that there will eventually be separate federal indictments against some of the uh, un uh, unnamed co-conspirators that are listed in that uh, indictment. But even though they're unnamed in the indictment, we know who very likely who they are. Uh, a second big difference uh, is that this is state rather than federal. Uh, so it's a somewhat different, though related body of law. And it's worth noting that state charges cannot be pardoned uh, by the president of the United States. Uh, he can pardon federal charges, though there is a dispute over whether a president could pardon charges against himself. Uh, that's a longstanding disagreement among legal scholars about that issue. Uh, but uh, even if Trump were to become president again after the 24 election, he could not pardon these state charges. Uh, and then a third big difference is that uh, in addition to a number of charges which look similar in some ways at least to federal charges like charges about fraud uh, and, uh, uh, and charges that relate to schemes about fake electors and the like that are cast as uh, in the in form of fraud against the government, uh, there is also charges under RICO uh, and not the federal RICO that many people may be familiar with from various cases against organized crime figures, but the Georgia state version of RICO, which in some ways is similar to the federal one, but in some ways is different. And I admit I'm not a RICO expert, uh, not even on the federal RICO, much less the state RICO. So I don't know how to fully assess that, but it does seem to me that this is an important feature of the Georgia charges that is not present uh, in the federal ones, though it is also the case that some of the charges in the Georgia case are essentially what I would call state versions of the federal charges, uh, charge about fraud uh, and the like. Uh, and you might say it's unfair that essentially similar conduct, or in some cases, even the same conduct, 
could be charged in both state and federal court. You can argue this violates double jeopardy. Uh, but the Supreme Court has said several times, most recently, just a couple years ago, that the so-called dual sovereign uh, doctrine means that it's not double jeopardy if one set of charges about the same thing is federal and the other is state. I happen to disagree with the Supreme Court majority on that, but they're the ones who get to decide that uh, and not me. Could I jump in there? So I, sure. in prepping for this, I was fascinated by some of your writings specifically on the double jeopardy issue. Um, sure. Could you unpack that a little bit, what your disagreement with that is? Um, when, when did the Supreme Court hand down this decision? It was relatively recent, right? So the roots of the uh, doctrine are not recent. This dual okay. sovereign theory has been around for a long time. Uh, but the Supreme but the Court, Supreme Court case, but the Supreme Court yeah. reaffirmed the idea in Gamble versus the United States, which is a 2019 decision. Uh, it was a 7-2 decision with both liberal and conservative justice in majority. But in dissent, uh, we had uh, one conservative justice, Justice Gorsuch, and one liberal justice, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I happen to agree with many of the points those two justices make, uh, but the Supreme Court is an institution that decides things by majority vote. And I do admit, uh, as Ginsburg and Gorsuch do, that the dual sovereign doctrine was not simply a product of the 2019 decision. It had long standing roots. And one of the reasons why the majority reaffirmed it was in part because of this uh, long standing precedent. So the basic idea is that double jeopardy does apply if the same entity, like the same level of government, files uh, the same charges or essentially the same charges twice. But if it's different entities, that is one is federal and the other is state, then the, the theory is, well, they're not really the same charges because even though they're about the same kinds of things and maybe even about the same exact events, uh, it's still different crimes uh, and not the same crime because one crime is created uh, in this case by the state of Georgia, uh, by statutes they have enacted, and the other by the federal government. Uh, so, <clears throat> I've seen some arguments that this Georgia case, and this is coming from people who do want to see Trump prosecuted, but they believe the Georgia case should be brought up to the federal level. It should not yes. be a state case. Do you have any opinion on that? So, yes, another issue that this case raises is the argument that this should be tried in federal court rather than uh, in state court, as with RICO, this is an area, the issue of removal, that I'm not a true expert on. So what I say about it is going to be very tentative, and I admit there could be angles that I am missing. Uh, so uh, there is a removal doctrine, which says, among other things, that uh, if a federal official is charged uh, with offenses that are really about things that he did as a matter of his official duty, uh, then, uh, th then you know, the case has to be dealt with in federal court or can be removed to federal court, at least if the defendant wants it to be. Uh, and this argument applies to some, though not all, of the defendants in the Georgia case. Obviously, Donald Trump can make this argument. Mark Meadows, who was Trump's acting chief of staff at the time, has made the argument there essentially saying what we were doing was related to our jobs as federal officials. Various other people who are charged, like John Eastman, for example, and various people in Georgia, these people were not uh, federal officials at the time, so they can't make this removal argument. Uh, they, you know, they have to be tried in Georgia, if, if anywhere. In my view, and again, it's tentative, I don't think this removal argument holds water, uh, and that's true for two reasons. One is the President of the United States and his staff have no role in organizing and running presidential elections. Uh, that's by design. The founders created that and a system that way be in part because it would be an obvious conflict of interest if the president had a role in running the proceedings for uh, his own uh, election or re-election. Uh, secondly, uh, even aside from that point, uh, things like uh, you know uh, schemes to replace the real electors with fake electors or to pressure state officials to, in effect, falsify vote counts, these things are beyond any plausible definition of the president's or his chief of staff's official jo uh, f jobs. And therefore, it seems to me that this removal argument is, is relatively weak. But I admit, again, I'm not an expert on this. I could be missing something. If people are interested in this, there is a lot of commentary on this issue by scholars and other experts who really uh, 
do know a lot about this removal issue. I do not like the uh, trend of people essentially proclaiming themselves as insta experts on things that you know they only first thought about you know a few days ago, or, or in this case, a couple weeks ago. And uh, therefore, I want to be very careful in what I say about this particular issue. But it is obviously an issue that, in the Georgia military. case in a way that it's not an issue in the federal case, which is from the beginning in federal court, uh, and so removal you know does not come up. So right. you very forcefully argued that there is a, a very strong case for prosecuting Trump from a deterrence perspective and a retribution perspective. perspective. Sure. Could you walk us through why should libertarians be supportive of prosecuting Trump? Give us just the sure. basics of that case. And sure. Zach will pull up some material to sort of support what you're talking about. Sure. Uh, so in the piece that you reference, I take a step back and ask, well, why do we have criminal punishment in the first place? And there are a number of different kinds of answers that different people give to that question. Uh, and indeed, libertarians don't agree among themselves necessarily on this, just as non-libertarians have disagreements. But the most common answers are retribution and deterrence. Retribution is simply the idea that some people deserve punishment because they did something evil or terrible, like committing murder, rape, assault, theft, and so on. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, we punish them because they deserve it, not because necessarily there are good extended consequences to punishment, but simply because it's the right thing to do in itself in a situation where the defendant has committed some particularly heinous or reprehensible act. Uh, then deterrence is the idea uh, that we punish people uh, to prevent others uh, from committing the same acts in the future. So on this theory, we punish the murderer or the rapist or the thief, not necessarily because they deserve it, though maybe they do, uh, but because punishing them sends a signal to other potential criminals or potential perpetrators of the same acts that, you know, this is what will happen to you if you do this, uh, and therefore, uh, you know, you shouldn't do it. Uh, you, you should think twice before you do it, and hopefully you'll be deterred from doing it. I recognize not everybody necessarily uh, accepts either retribution or deterrence, and there are some libertarians who believe there should be no criminal punishment at all, just as there are some left-wing people who believe that. So if you believe there should be no criminal punishment for anybody, and you reject both the retribution theory and a the deterrence theory, I'm not going to suggest that you should support prosecuting Trump anyway. I'm going to, there you, you would have to consistently say, I oppose prosecuting Trump, just like I oppose prosecuting pretty much anybody, because I don't think there should be criminal punishment for anyone of any kind. And similarly, there are some libertarians who argue that the system of criminal justice should be replaced uh, purely by a system of civil justice. And if you believe that, you won't be persuaded by the uh, criminal uh, prosecution arguments against Trump either, that you would face some interesting issues about whether Trump should face civil liability for what he did. But if you do accept uh, the ideas of retribution or the idea of deterrence, then there is a very strong case for prosecuting Trump for what he did uh, in his efforts to overturn the 2020 election uh, through the use of fraud and the threat of force. Because uh, certainly in a de democratic system, one of the most reprehensible things that any high official can do, particularly the president, is attempt to stay in power even after he lost an election, which in this case, he very clearly did. And staying in power by the use of fraud, in this case, uh, you know, finding fake electors or pressuring officials to falsify vote counts and the like, that is very reprehensible. And it goes beyond merely just asserting that you won the election, even though you didn't. This is actually taking action through the use of fraud to overturn it. And then, of course, instigating the attack on the Capitol uh, adds force uh, to fraud. The purpose of that was to disrupt the certification of the electoral votes. So if anything is a reprehensible act for a high official in a democracy that deserves retribution, this is a good example. Uh, and the same point applies to deterrence, uh, that uh, we it's very important to deter high officials from serious misconduct of various kinds is actually more important than deterring low level officials or deterring private citizens. Uh, and given the enormous potential benefits to a power hungry politician of being able to stay in power indefinitely 
even if he loses an election, and in fact making himself dictator for life, or at least dictator for another four years or the like. Uh, it's important for there to be severe punishment for schemes like this so as to deter future power-hungry politicians uh, from doing the same kind of thing that Trump tried to do. Some of what Trump tried to do may be put down to just specific aspects of his personality or the circumstances that uh, of the 2020 election, uh, but the desire to stay in power as long as possible is one that's not unique to Trump. It's one that many politicians have. Indeed, a desire for power is one of the main reasons why many of these people uh, want to be politicians in the first place. So if you're a libertarian and you're suspicious of government power, uh, one of the things that you should worry about is politicians uh, who try to keep themselves in power indefinitely, even if they lose an election. Democracy has many flaws from a libertarian perspective. I've done scholarship on many of those flaws myself. So I'm not arguing that anything democratic is good. Uh, but I would say from a libertarian perspective or any more general liberal perspective, democracy is less bad uh, than politicians who get to stay in power even if they lose an election because democracy does provide some useful check uh, on the abuses of politicians, even if it's flawed and even if it does also in some cases cause abuses as well. So I think there is a strong retribution case for punishing Trump, given the extreme heinousness of the actions he undertook. And there is a strong deterrence case because uh, what he did is the kind of thing that it's especially important to deter. And particularly when we're dealing with the official who held the most powerful office in the land. If some low level flunky did something similar, uh, the need for deterrence might be less uh, and maybe the heinousness would be less as well. The, the reprehensibility would be less, but uh, with, with Trump, uh, given that he was the president, uh, both retribution and deterrence mm -hmm. uh, are particularly significant in this case in a way that goes beyond even when you know ordinary people or low ranking officials do something similar. Speaking of heinous action, Zach, do you have some evidence, uh, some slides to go through? Well, yeah, I mean, and we're going to get, uh, as we advance in this conversation, into some of the replies to what you laid out, uh, Ilya, because I know you, you've gone back and forth with some scholars on this. Because when we're talking about deterrence, you know, uh, we want to clearly establish here what, what is the behavior we want to deter, sure. what is laid out in this case. Some of the critics would say that the unintended consequences of this could be that you are deterring legitimate speech or legitimate questioning of election results where there there may have been um, fraud in play. I, I don't think that was the case here, but um, th th those are some of the concerns that we'll get into in, in, in a minute. But first, let's look at the 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 case the the actual case that uh, Georgia has laid out against Trump. Um, this is there's 41 counts. There's 19 uh, defendants named, uh, including Trump and many of his lawyers, Rudy Giuliani. Uh, you mentioned John Eastman. Um, Act one that they zero in on here is on the fourth of November, which would be election night 2020, when Donald Trump gave a speech where they say he falsely declared victory and falsely claimed voter fraud. We have a clip from that speech. Let's take a look at that clip and then talk about it in the context of this case. We won states that we weren't expected to win. Florida, we didn't win it. We won it by a lot. And <laughs> It's also clear that we have won Georgia. Yeah. We, we're up by 2.5% or 117,000 votes with only 7% left. They're never going to catch us. They can't catch us. But most importantly, we're winning Pennsylvania by a tremendous yeah. amount of votes. Yeah. We're and all of a sudden, everything just stopped. This is a fraud on the American public. This is an embarrassment to our country. We were getting ready to win this election. Frankly, we did win this election. We did win this election. 
So uh, I should also note that the the um, the Georgia case, the prosecutors allege that the speech was actually drafted four days or some version of it was drafted four days before the election. Um, I'll we'll be interested to see if they present evidence of that. But how might that speech, Ilya, particularly if there's evidence that it was drafted in advance, implicate begin to implicate Trump in criminal conspiracy? So what I would say is no one, including the prosecutors in the Georgia case, claims that merely giving that speech is illegal. This is something that is misleading in some of the criticism that is offered of the indictment, that when you have the listing of the acts, the, uh, the listing of acts is not a listing of things that the prosecutors say are by themselves illegal. Rather, that speech, which included a number of false claims that we can talk about, uh, is just part of the evidence uh, indicating uh, that Trump had a broader scheme to overturn the election result after he lost it. And indeed, one that he began to lay down even before the election. That's why it's important it was drafted ahead of time, because it's clear that he was going to claim fr fraud regardless of how and by how much he lost. Uh, and you know, there's evidence of that. But merely saying I was the victim of fraud would not have led to this indictment. Rather, the statements about being a victim of fraud, false statements, uh, were uh, part of a scheme that involved things that are actually were illegal, which is uh, trying to uh, replace the real electors with false electors, pressuring state officials into falsifying the vote counts, as in the famous uh, call with the uh, with the Secretary of State of Georgia, where he said, well, find me 11,780 votes, which is happening to be the exact number of votes that he, was, uh, that he needed to overcome Biden's lead uh, in Georgia. Uh, so uh, this is similar to if I merely say, you know, Bob is a scumbag and he deserves to die, that itself is perfectly legal. Uh, at least it's not a criminal violation, you know, setting aside possible claims of libel or slander. Uh, but if I then proceed uh, to tell my flunkies, you know, go out and whack Bob, uh, then the previous statement where I say that Bob deserves to die could be brought as evidence against me in court, evidence of the motive uh, uh, and plan that I had to, you know, to have Bob killed. And the same thing applies to uh, Trump's statements alleging fraud and also to Trump's plans that were clearly weighed down even before the election to allege fraud uh, in, in, in any situation where he might lose. It's worth going for a moment if we have time on what was false about Trump's statement. Uh, yeah, and that is, uh, but, but it, we, we could do that or if you'd like to move on. You know, we no, can, please do. No, lay it out yeah. for us. I think that yeah, would be so, really uh, so it is true that in some of the states that Trump ended up losing on election night, he was still leading in the count. But that was because of the so-called blue shift, uh, where because Trump for many months before the election had claimed that absentee voting or mail-in voting uh, was fraudulent or suspicious, many Republicans believed what he said. And so Republicans disproportionately voted on election day, whereas Democrats, as a result, disproportionately voted by mail in the many states which permit this. And therefore, in states like Pennsylvania and some others, which first counted the in-person vote and only later counted the mail vote. Initially, uh, Republicans started out with a big lead, but as these other votes, which were disproportionately Democratic, were counted, and there's nothing wrong with counting them, indeed it would be illegal if they had not been counted and unfair as well, uh, then uh, what initially started out as a, a lead for, the Repu for, for Trump turned into a lead for Biden, and many experts predicted ahead of time that this is what would happen, given the hesitancy of, of many Republicans to uh, do mail-in voting, uh, which was a new thing in the 2020 election. Before 2020, actually, mail-in and absentee voting in many states was actually somewhat disproportionately Republican. But Trump, ironically himself, was responsible for the, seat, for the trend, which led to the perception that you know, he had a big lead, which was somehow you know, undermined. Uh, and uh, really within hours uh, of that statement, it became very clear uh, that, in, in, that in these states, uh, the eventual vote count would show uh, that Trump had pretty decisively lost. He ultimately lost Pennsylvania by doing something like a high, close to 80 or 100,000 votes. Uh, and he lost these other states, uh, the swing states, by many thousands of votes uh, as well. Uh, and uh, so to so, be clear, uh, also to be clear, 
you know, to the extent that there were any irregularities with the ballots and the mail-in balloting, the Trump team did challenge this stuff in sure, court. Of and I assume we are all in agreement here that that's a totally legitimate route yes, to of course. take and has yes, been of done course. before. Right. Trump and his supporters filed over 60 lawsuits uh, challenging the results in various states. That itself is perfectly legal, though I think it was somewhat abusive in a case where the overwhelming evidence was that there was no chance that the results would be overturned. But he certainly had a legal right to do that. And that wasn't a crime. Uh, and it's worth noting that Trump lost all but one of those cases. And the one he won in Pennsylvania did not come close to overturning the uh, large margin that Biden had in that state. And it's important, and this is relevant to the criminal aspect of the case, that he continued his fake elector scheme and other efforts to overturn the election, even after he lost all those cases, uh, and even after it became clear from the way those cases developed uh, that he and his supporters had no real evidence of fraud on anything like the scale necessary to change the result. Uh, it's also obviously. correct. Hold on. Get me. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong here. But is it also correct that some of the judges overseeing and and issuing you know rulings on those lawsuits were in fact also Trump appointed? Yes, absolutely. And like indeed, like one of the most thing, eloquent though. and powerful opinions uh, on this issue uh, was written by a Third Circuit Trump uh, appointee uh, who you know he had nominated for that position. Uh, and it's worth noting that in some of the state cases that were brought in state courts. Uh, many of those cases were also decided uh, by conservative Republican judges, uh, obviously state judges, not federal ones, and uh, conservative Republican election officials in a number of these states like Georgia also certified the results. Brad Raffensperger, the Georgia Secretary of State, uh, whom Trump tried to pressure in that famous or notorious call. He is a conservative Republican. He would have been very happy to see Trump win the state of Georgia, but he knew that simply wasn't the case given the margin of uh, over 11,000 votes and given the lack of evidence of fraud or other problems in anything like the scale that would have been necessary to overturn that margin. So it's yeah, not the case that only liberal judges heard <laughs> these cases or only liberal democratic officials were involved in certifying the results. Yeah, Bra so Raffensperger it, it, would seemingly have every reason to um, decide to abdicate his responsibility and to succumb yes. to the Trump pressure. But the fact that he didn't is, at least to me, that's been one of the really interesting components of this case that I think many of the MAGA heads have not really appropriately dealt with at all. Yeah, and I, I agree with you. You can say, well, you know, this guy's a rhino or he's an establishment person or whatever. But if the only evidence that he's a rhino is the very thing that you're questioning, then, uh, you know, his decision making in this particular instance, then, you know, that's a you know relatively weak argument. Uh, the, another key moment in the case, we played the clip of Trump at the, uh, you know, um, on election night. We can now fast forward to his speech on January 6th in front of the Stop the Steal crowd uh, and uh, react to that. So let's play that and then see how that works And I hope Mike is going to do the right thing. I hope so. I hope so. Because if Mike Pence does the right thing, we win the election. All he has to do, all in, this is, this is from the number one or certainly one of the top constitutional lawyers in our country. He has the absolute right to do it. We're supposed to protect our country, support our country, support our Constitution and protect our Constitution. States want to revote. The states got defrauded. They were given false information. They voted on it. Now they want to recertify. They want it back. All Vice President Pence has to do is send it back to the states to recertify. And we become president, and you are the happiest people. So we all know what happened after that. How does that moment potentially strengthen Trump's prosecutors? So it doesn't strengthen uh, them as much as a number of other moments in that same speech. But obviously here uh, we have further evidence, or there's much other evidence of Trump's uh, desire to push through an illegal scheme. The illegal scheme here is uh, twofold. One is getting Pence to set aside the results, which Pence had no power to do. 
unfortunately, Pence himself rightly concluded that he didn't have the power to do it and therefore did not, in fact, try to do this. Second uh, is the effort to replace the actual electors actually certified by the states with fake electors who were not certified at all. Uh, the statement that he made there, which said where he said, what the states want to uh, revoke or, or change results, that is simply false. None of the states, uh, the state legislatures or certifying officials made any effort to uh, change their results or revoke them. Even if they had made such an effort by this point, it would still have been illegal because it would have been past the deadline uh, set by law by which they had to. Uh, uh, submit their electoral slates. Uh, but the fact is that no actual state governments tried to uh, change the you know, Biden slates to Trump slates. What you had is essentially you know, Trump supporters who were not actual uh, state officials empowered in this process, you know, attempting to uh, you know, fraudulently insinuate fake electors instead of the real ones. Um, and you mentioned there's other parts of the speech that you find more damning. Could you just yeah. So there's what other parts of the speech, which I think strongly suggest that he wanted to use the violent threat of the crowd to pressure Congress into uh, denying certification of the results. Uh, these are to pass the famous patches where he says you should fight like hell and march to Capitol and so forth. Uh, and right. I think this needs to be uh, considered in not just in the context of what's in the speech, but also in the context of Trump's previous encouragement and endorsement of violence on a number of occasions, both during the 2016 election and in 2020, when he, for instance, praised Proud Boys and others who attacked uh, people violently. Uh, and uh, it should be viewed in the context of uh, evidence uncovered by the January 6th Commission in Congress, uh, which said that when he heard about the riot, Trump actually wanted to go to the Capitol and lead the and lead the attack, uh, even though he also was restrained by his Secret Service agents from actually trying to do this. Uh, so I do recognize that statements like uh, such as "fight like hell" can be metaphorical, but in this case, I think uh, there is strong evidence to, given the overall context, to take them more literally. Though I should emphasize that the, neither the federal indictment nor the Georgia indictment directly charge him with inciting an insurrection or mm -hmm. inciting violence, but I do, but they do charge him with trying to use the threat of violence uh, as a way to leverage Congress. And we know that even while the attack in the Capitol was going on, he was trying to call various senators and representatives to try to get them to deny certification of the results and to use the threat of the riot or the fact that the riot was going on as part of his leverage uh, to do so. I right. would okay. love to move us to a few audience questions, some pushback sure. on these points that you just made, if that's cool. Um, you know, one one commenter, A. Blinken, says um, most of the cases were thrown out for lack of standing. The cases weren't even heard. What do you make of that? Is that accurate? Th th that is not true. Some cases were thrown out on procedural grounds, but about 30, about half the total cases were decided on the merits, either because the court actually reached the merits or because the court said, well, you, the plaintiffs, uh, either Trump or his supporters, need to present evidence uh, of, of fraud. And they said, no, 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 we don't actually have any evidence of fraud. And therefore, they withdrew the case for that reason. Uh, so okay. about half the cases either ended up being withdrawn by the plaintiffs because they didn't have the necessary evidence of fraud or were in fact decided on the merits. Okay, uh, I so wanted I want to do two more um, really briefly. Uh, I also really appreciate that our commenters are, you know, giving this type of pushback because I think, you know, so many publications sure. out there and so many journalists aren't interested in engaging in this type of thing. And like, I think it is important that we um, steel man the, the other side's argument as best as we possibly can. Um, one person, Agorizer, says he wasn't asking for Georgia to find votes for him. He was asking Georgia to find illegitimate votes for JRB, who I imagine is Joseph Robinette Biden, uh, as Matt Welch would say. Uh, what do you make of that, the idea that it, he was yeah, asking? I, I, think that, I, I think that is not true. First, okay. the actual statement uh, by Trump is find me 11,780 votes, uh, which, uh, you know, seem to say, you know, find votes for me. But also, uh, even if you interpret it as disqualify votes for Biden, that still is an attempt to uh, pressure Raffensperger into an illegal scheme, given that by the time this call happened, first, all of Trump's 
uh, legal challenges in Georgia alleging fraud had failed. And second, no evidence of any large scale fraud had been uh, brought up. And third, mm -hmm. if you look at the transcript of this actual conversation, Raffensperger, who was the official in a position to know, and as I noted earlier, a conservative Republican, he repeatedly tells Trump that there's no evidence of large scale fraud or other problems. And Trump clearly doesn't care about that and just says, you know, find me the votes. So given the context, uh, I think it is very clear that Trump was indifferent to the question of whether the 11,780 votes were going to be found legally or illegally. He just wanted those votes so he could prevail in Georgia. I Let mean, me bring I'm, up a question that yeah. I, I'd like to address here from the audience from Josh Lyon. Not even close to persecution. Holy cow. Even proposing that as a legitimate question is dishonest as hell. Uh, I just want to say that we are going to have these conversations, <laughs> whether you like it or not, and other people are going to have these conversations. The frustrating thing about the past five years or, or so has been the attempts to rein in what is acceptable discourse. And so I just totally reject that that kind of frame. And um, if people are upset by us, you know, trying to have a frank discussion about one of the most important political issues, then I, I don't know what to tell you. That's what we're here for. There's also a question uh, for uh, Ghost of Recon threw in $2 and said, presumption of innocence is missing in his analysis. Um, is that true, Ilya? I mean, I, yeah. I assume so you- So presumption of innocence is a standard that applies in court. Uh, and I totally agree that Trump should not be convicted unless uh, they can prove his guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. However, in public discourse where what's at stake is, you know, I don't have the power to send Trump to prison or impose any right. punishment on him. All I'm doing is I is saying that I think based on the overwhelming mm -hmm. evidence that is already in the public sphere, that I think it is in fact the case that Trump is guilty of at least many of these charges, just as I also think, for instance, that O.J. Simpson was guilty of murdering those two people, even though I totally agree uh, that, of course, he deserved uh, the presumption of, evidence, of innocence in court. And I also agree to my merely thinking uh, that Simpson was guilty of those murders, that, that that by itself is not enough to send him to court. So I think there's an important distinction between uh, what we can conclude as a matter of seeking the truth in public discourse and legal standards that must be met in court uh, before somebody can actually be sent to prison or indeed subjected to any kind of criminal punishment. Can we before we move oh, before we move on to the the next section, which is going to be responding to some of the other criticisms that you've dealt with and people you've gone back and forth with, Ilya. I just want to say thank you to Wishes Network for a five dollar donation. I don't think there was a question attached to that, but uh, if you have one, throw it in later. Go ahead, Liz. Oh, I was just going to ask, could you play that Matt Whitaker clip, Zach? Uh, sure. It's a really sad day for our country. I mean, if you believe in the rule of law and if you believe in equal justice under the law, this should concern you uh, because, you know, we have what appears to be a completely political prosecution of the former president, the current leader for the Republican nomination. And, you know, it is uh, it was a rush uh, to get him indicted. You know, you look at the other cases, compare this to Hunter Biden's case, Joe Biden's case, Vice President Pence's. And even, uh, you know, Hillary Clinton. And, and, and I just, I can't see how the Department of Justice isn't explaining why they're doing this case and none of these other cases that I just mentioned. It's, it's really a sad day, Harrison. And I, and I think it's, uh, it's the stuff of banana republics, quite frankly. So I am fascinated by this because this is something we keep hearing from so many Trump uh, lackeys and boosters uh, and people in the media, frankly. Uh, and you've written really forcefully, Ilya, that... Actually, the Banana Republic talking point is totally incorrect. And I was doing a little bit of digging into this, and you actually look at the degree to which other um, you know, countries hold their former leaders accountable for crimes um, after they leave office. I mean, we see this with Netanyahu. We see this with um, Nicolas Sarkozy, with Silvio Berlusconi. This isn't just the stuff of you know Banana Republics. This is something that decent democracies in the developed world actually frequently do. And frankly, as a libertarian, I mean, I would maybe like to see more people in positions of power held accountable for um, things they do wrong, things criminal things that they do when in office. How do you respond to the Banana Republic talking point, Ilya? 
in two ways. One of them you've already done for me, which is that many well-established, respected democracies have in fact prosecuted current or even for current or former heads of government or heads of state. You just listed some of them, France, Israel, the prime minister of Israel is under indictment for various crimes right now. Uh, and South Korea, uh, the former president was removed from power and she was prosecuted for corruption, I believe. I can't remember offhand, but I think she spent time in prison. Uh, so uh, countries which pretty obviously are not banana republics do this on a regular basis. Uh, but secondly, if there's one thing that is banana republic, it's a president uh, who is who tries to stay in power despite losing an election. Part of what goes on in a banana republic is that even though we have the forms of democracy, we don't have the reality because the person in power can, in fact, falsify the election or use force and fraud to stay in power, even if he loses. And that's the kind of thing that Trump attempted to do. And if we want to keep from becoming a banana republic or at least reduce the chances of doing so, we have to uh, inflict retribution and deterrence on high officials who do this sort of thing. Uh, even if, uh, uh, and indeed, it's particularly important to impose punishment on them, especially given that uh, we would, without hesitation, impose it on low-level officials or private citizens who tried to do similar things. Uh, I want to also comment, if you have time, on first, who Matthew Whitaker is, and second, uh, some of the other statements he said regarding Biden, Hillary Clinton, and the like. Matthew Whitaker is not a neutral objective observer. Matthew Whitaker was Trump's acting attorney general uh, after Trump got rid of Jeff Sessions, his first attorney general. Why? Because Sessions, although a very right-wing Republican with an ideology pretty similar to Trump's own and MAGA populist, he was unwilling to go along with some of Trump's illegal schemes and the like. So Whitaker was made acting attorney general because Trump assumed that you know Whitaker uh, would be willing to do this sort of stuff. And he only remained acting because Trump uh, likely calculated that Whitt Whitaker could not be confirmed even by what was then a Republican controlled Senate. That doesn't by itself prove that the things he's saying are false, but it does suggest that this is not a very credible person. Uh, what he's saying regarding uh, Biden and Hillary Clinton, uh, with the case of Biden, it is true that Biden, like Trump, uh, is under investigation for possibly holding on to classified documents when he shouldn't have. And indeed, uh, the Justice Department appointed a special counsel, uh, a former Trump official, no less, to investigate Biden's retention of classified documents. And if that special counsel determines that charges are warranted, maybe at some point they'll be filed. Uh, you can tell a similar story about Hillary Clinton's email server. If you believe that's a, a crime that should be charged, uh, then among the people responsible for failing to charge it are actually the people in the Trump administration who had four years to file charges in that case if they thought it was warranted, uh, and yet they didn't. Uh, but none of this stuff is on the same plane as trying to use force and fraud to stay in power after you lose a presidential election. Neither Biden nor Hillary Clinton, despite I think some real sins and arguably abuses of power that they commit in other instances, none of them did something like that. So uh, there is no double standard on that. And on the classified documents, again, uh, both uh, Trump and Biden uh, have been investigated by a special counsel uh, on that. And uh, the special counsel in investigating Biden uh, you know, is simply taking longer on that. It's unlikely that he's taking longer to help Biden, given that that special counsel is a U.S. attorney previously appointed by Trump. If anything, it might actually be worse for Biden if charges end up being filed against him close to an election rather than uh, the investigation being completed uh, earlier than that. And That's to be clear, uh, the Matthew Whitaker clip was him talking about the uh, classified documents case, but you hear okay, the yeah. Banana Republic That's fair. Uh, canard yeah. often uh, in, in relation to all these cases. Another sure. uh, line of criticism you hear comes courtesy of Rand Paul's tweet here, where he says, one way to destroy a democratic republic is to criminalize speech. When will democratic supporters of the First Amendment step forward? Uh, and the article that he links here is headlined, the criminalization of politics to get Trump is endangering everyone's speech. What is your reply to that concern that we are in danger of making any sort of 
pushback or s uh, speeches about uh, electoral issues a crime? Yeah, the response is simple. No one, including B Trump, is being prosecuted simply for saying the election was fraudulent or simply for saying Trump uh, deserved to win the election. Those are false claims, but they are not violations of criminal law and they should not be. Rather, what Trump is being prosecuted for and others as well is for uh, not merely speaking, but planning and taking action. The scheme to, to replace real electors with false ones, to pressure state officials, in some cases also to defraud the courts, placing false evidence in court and the like. Uh, and it is true that part of what's involved in these schemes is speech, but that can be said for any kind of criminal conspiracy. If a mafia boss tells one of his underlings, you know, you know, I don't want to see Joe around anymore, let's whack him, you can say, well, that's just speech. Uh, but of course, it's speech that's part of an effort to produce action. And that makes mm -hmm. it different from a mere expression of political opinion or uh, any kind of opinion. Uh, and I think there is, it's important not to conflate a situation where speech is being prosecuted purely because it expresses some kind of uh, wrong or uh, objectionable opinion and a, and a case where speech is part of a plan of action and is being prosecuted for that reason. A more substantive, I think, uh, critique of the case for prosecuting Trump comes from Jack Goldsmith, uh, who you've engaged with in writing before. He's a former AG for George W. Bush. He published this op-ed in the New York Times call entitled The Prosecution of Trump May Have Terrible Consequences. And he's making the reason I find this more persuasive in a way is that it's not really even trying to make the case that Trump didn't do something wrong or, you know, that he, he uh, you know, legal, legally isn't culpable, but he's kind of taking a more pragmatic approach. And he's what he says here also is that this is all happening against the backdrop of perceived unfairness in the Justice Department's earlier investigation originating in the Obama administration of Mr. Trump's connections to Russia in the 2016 general election. Also, the perceived unfairness in the department's treatment of Mr. Biden's son, Hunter. Uh, he goes on, these are not what aboutism points. They're in the context, they're the context in which a very large part of the country will fairly judge the legitimacy of the Justice Department's election fraud prosecution of Mr. Trump. Now, uh, you know, so for me, there there's an ideal in which politicians face the same justice system as the rest of us. And then there's the reality in which the DOJ and the FBI undermine the first half of the Trump presidency with a Russia collusion case that did not pan out, put all sorts of backdoor pressure on social media in the lead up to the 2020 election to suppress content under the guise of misinformation. And then the timing of all this is just terrible, especially with the federal case going to trial right before Super Tuesday. It all makes me more sympathetic to the argument that even if Trump in some cosmic sense deserves prosecution, that there's no way it's going to do anything than further degrade the legitimacy of the institutions of justice that we as libertarians want to have legitimacy to do things like secure our liberties by administering justice. What is your reaction to that, Ilya? Yeah. So Jack Goldsmith is a more serious and substantial figure, certainly, than Matt Whitaker, who was quoted earlier, and his concerns deserve to be taken seriously. Nonetheless, I think he's largely wrong. The biggest thing on which he's wrong about is he simply doesn't consider uh, the weighty points on the other side, which is what will happen if Trump is not prosecuted for this stuff and is allowed to get away scot-free. First of all, uh, that will incentivize other politicians, perhaps including also Trump himself, to do similar things in the future. If you can lose an election and try to stay in power by force and fraud, and it's a freebie, why not? Go ahead and do it. And you know the worst that will happen is your scheme will fail, uh, but you won't suffer any uh, punishment for it. That's a terrible set of incentives, and it's awful. Uh, and that's a much greater risk than any of these scenarios that um, 
uh, Goldsmith uh, posits. Secondly, with respect to perceptions of legitimacy, he has a lot of solicitation for the feelings of Trump supporters and their perceptions, but what about the rest of us? And what we will think about the legitimacy of the justice system if a person is able to get away with this kind of behavior and this kind of criminal abuse of power merely because he's a prominent politician uh, and his supporters are likely to get mad if he's prosecuted and convicted. Uh, that will certainly degrade uh, the uh, legitimacy of the justice system in the eyes of the roughly 60 to 70 percent of the population who do know that Trump commit, uh, uh, lost the election and who believe that he deserves prosecution uh, for uh, you know, his actions at that time. Uh, so if you're looking at judging these things by public perception and public reaction, and it may be that we shouldn't do that at all, but if we are going to judge that way, then we should consider the whole public and not merely the Trumpist public. Uh, and the rest of us matter too. And these people, because of their false perceptions, should not enjoy a veto power. Uh, I also but dispute it, some of what Goldsmith said about uh, you know some of the previous investigations and the like. While it is true that uh, they did not find quote unquote collusion between Trump and Russian agents, uh, there was good reason to investigate him for that because there was a lot of evidence of contact between Trump campaign officials and various Russian agents. The Mueller report weighs this out in great detail. Uh, and as for Hunter Biden, well, in fairness, this hadn't happened yet, but we just in, in the last couple of days uh, have heard the announcement that he will in fact uh, be charged and very likely uh, prosecuted. Uh, you can argue he should be prosecuted more and that there's some double standards there that could well be. Uh, it's nowhere near on the scale of Trump trying to stay in power despite losing an election and using force and fraud to do so. So the fact that officials or in this case, relatives of high government officials can get away you know, with some smaller scale wrongs that would not be forgiven ordinary people, that's a bad thing and we should criticize that. Uh, that in no way justifies uh, letting Trump get away with something far, far worse than anything Hunter Biden is charged with. Okay, but uh, for Trump supporters and some non-Trump supporters, which I, I'm not a Trump supporter, but it, it is you—you do—you do get the the feeling, <laughs> given the timing of this, given kind of the the constant investigations that uh, Trump has has been under, that it's the the attitude from the beginning has been like we're going to do we're going to throw whatever we can at this guy to stop him from you know staying in the presidency or getting elected again what is like just in a practical sense what is why not let this play out um in the political arena rather than in the halls of justice uh you know yeah. there was the chance to impeach him, which the House did, and then the Senate did not convict. Um, there's the ballot box. Why not just leave it to the uh, leave this in the realm of politics? For three reasons. Two of them I've already mentioned before. Retribution and deterrence. He deserves retribution, and we need to deter future officials from engaging in the same kind of behavior. Uh, and the political process by itself cannot do that, uh, especially in the case of retribution. Uh, third, uh, it is makes no sense to say we're going to rely purely on the political process uh, to deal with schemes whose very purpose is, in fact, to undermine that very process. The whole point of Trump's scheme to overturn the 2020 election was to stay in power even after he lost, to short circuit that process. And therefore, uh, the process by itself uh, is not sufficient to deal with a scheme that, if it's successful, would actually destroy that very process. Additional mechanisms are needed uh, to deal with that. Uh, and criminal prosecution, while not the only possible mechanism, is an important one uh, that stands a good chance of being effective. What do you make of, I think one of the arguments that people sort of frequently conflate is you know, Trump has been persecuted by, you know, the court system, by by people bringing, you know, lawsuits against him, but also that Trump has been persecuted by much of the media and that the, the narrative surrounding Trump has sort of been predecided ever since he uh, came down that escalator and announced his original, his initial bid for presidency. There has been just a ton of aggressive animus directed his way. And I think sometimes, like, I'm sympathetic to the argument that he's been 
persecuted in some ways and treated very unfairly by much of the media, but not sympathetic to the argument that uh, that is the case in the court system. I think it is absolutely heinous what he did in terms of attempting to uh, cast doubt on the legitimacy of the election based off of very flimsy evidence. I think it's important for that evidence to be weighed. But as we discussed before, I mean, you know, those 60 cases that were considered and the 30 of which were actually judged on their merits, the fact that only one turned up any sort of substantial evidence um, and, and 29 of them did not proceed and did not find any evidence, I think is uh, super, super compelling. What do you make of sort of Trumpist argument that like there has been such persecution before all of this happened and it, it leave such a sour taste in their mouths where they're not totally sure that he'll get a fair shake. Do you think there's any validity to that? Yeah. So I think your distinction between the courts and the media, I think is, is largely right in that when cases have been filed against him in court, he has been uh, treated fairly indeed, probably more fairly than in sort of an ordinary person would have in some of these cases in that, for instance, right now, uh, if an ordinary person was charged with the kinds of things that Trump was charged with and then made the kinds of comments about potential jurors that he has made implicitly threatening them, there's likely that the ordinary person would be in pretrial detention rather than out free. Uh, and also that at the very least, he would be required to post very hefty bail, which Trump, uh, for the most part, is not been required to do. Uh, and the same thing, I think, is true in the civil system where various civil lawsuits should be filed against him. I think with Trump, as with any prominent politician, there are some claims made in the media about him which are unfair and untrue. That said, I'm not actually all that sympathetic to the argument that he's been persecuted by the media overall, even though there are certainly particular media claims that have been made that are, are, are likely wrong. Uh, and that is, if you want to complain about people being mean to you, uh, my answer in the case of Trump is uh, you, you reap what you sow. When you see how Trump talks about his opponents uh, or even people within his own party that disagree with him in various ways, uh, he certainly is not civil. He doesn't fairly weigh evidence. Indeed, he appeals to all kinds of bigotry and prejudice uh, of various kinds, uh, even in such things as his attacks on, uh, the, uh, on Elaine Chow, the wife of Mitch McConnell, for the fact that she is uh, of Chinese background, uh, you know, his uh, advocacy of racial and ethnic and religious bigotry and the like. So if you want to be treated nicely by other people, a good rule of thumb is treat those other people the way you yourself want to be treated. Uh, Trump very obviously doesn't do that. Uh, so it stands to reason, given his uh, complete unfairness to his opponents, uh, that other people are going to regard him negatively and sometimes, yes, be unfair to him uh, as well. Uh, I, but, you know, but he I has done plenty to justify uh, the fact that he gets a lot of me negative media coverage. I think we'll have to agree to disagree on that one. I don't know. I think that this is definitely a, almost a subject entirely worthy of its own live stream at some point. Sure. But uh, the ap like apoplectic way with which so many members of the mainstream media, writers at the New York Times and the Washington Post, have heralded the rise of Donald Trump. And then I think also the way they reacted to COVID and to the pandemic, at least for me, as both a journalist and a news consumer, I felt a certain um, distrust in many of these people to remain uh, even keeled and level headed in their portrayal of what was going on. Um, and, but that's, you know, a bigger complaint that I think we can get into some other time. Uh, Zach, did you want to move to yeah, the East yeah, I want to, um, you know, start to bring this conversation to a close by examining the other aspect of the Georgia case, which we mentioned the 18 alleged co-conspirators, mostly his attorneys like Jenna Ellis, Rudy Giuliani, and John Eastman, who was the intellectual architect of that elector scheme that Mike Pence rejected. Um, it's a scheme that was laid out in this six-point memo that was released. Um, I've highlighted a couple sections of this, including one aspect is that Pence would gavel in Trump uh, as re-elected after um, kind of rejecting one slate of electors for another and then force the other side to fight to to fight to fight it out in court. So going on a, a sort of offense and Point six here, he says the main thing here is that Pence should do this without asking for permission, either from a vote of the joint session or from the court. Let the other side challenge his actions in court. Eastman 
recently appeared, he appeared last week on Laura Ingram's show on Fox, and this is what he had to say in his defense. You know, the people that I was representing had a right to counsel. And what's going on here with the bar complaints against everybody involved in any of the litigation, this Fulton County complaint, the unindicted co-conspirators in the federal action, they're trying to stifle people from being able to get representation in election challenges. If, if disputed questions of constitutional law all of a sudden become criminal, we, we could, we could uh, throw, you know, the entire legal profession, the entire legal academy in, in jail. Now, the fact of the matter is, throughout our history, uh, significant uh, leaders in Congress have, have argued that Congress doesn't have authority under the 12th Amendment, that the founders specifically designed it that way, so that the president wouldn't owe his job to Congress. It's a core separation of powers principle that the founders adopted, and he just doesn't, he ignores that uh, in his analysis. So the notion that this is well settled is crazy. Is bringing the attorneys into this case, criminalizing dissent and criminalizing the uh, a profession of law, as Eastman suggests here, Ilya? In a word, no, uh, because what Eastman and some of the others were doing here went beyond simply giving legal advice. It was participating and urging a scheme of illegal conduct. In this case, as you highlighted in that memo, trying to get Pence to illegally reject the electoral votes uh, and the like. And there's many cases involving mafia lawyers, for example, where when the lawyer doesn't merely advise his client and sort of how to defend himself in court or something like that, but instead, uh, you know, participates in a scheme for, for illegal action, you know, lawyers can be prosecuted for that. And this is far from the first time uh, that this has happened. To be sure, there can be cases where there's gray areas, as with many legal doctrines. In this case, with Eastman and some of the others, I don't think it's that much of a gray area because Eastman was clearly urging the specific plan uh, that was uh, adopted here. Uh, he wasn't mere, even merely saying like, you know, somebody else wanted to get a plan and they asked Eastman whether it would be legal or not. Uh, you know, Eastman went beyond, you know, something uh, like that. So uh, if uh, you know, a mafia lawyer advises uh, his, you know, his mafia client that, you know, you know, we should we should kill this person. And not only that, but it would be legal to kill him because it would just be self-defense or something like that. Uh, you know, the mafia lawyer could be prosecuted for that and he couldn't hide behind, you know, the idea that he was just giving legal advice uh, that, that you know, the planning of future crimes uh, is one of the uh, standard exceptions to attorney-client privilege and one of the kinds of things that historically lawyers can be and have been prosecuted for when they engage in it. Okay, but isn't that kind of an extreme metaphor? You know, he, he wasn't uh, uh, advocating anyone be killed. He his argument is that this is a legitimate uh, contested area of constitutional interpretation. You you just agree. You just disagree that this is in any way a valid way to interpret the Constitution. So his argument was extremely bad, but uh, this is going beyond merely making a bad argument in the abstract. This is urging a specific course of action and planning it out. Uh, huh. And. Uh, I don't think it's at the comparison to the mafia is all that extreme when you recognize the dire, horrible consequences of what would have happened if this scheme had succeeded. That is that a president would have been able to stay in power despite losing an election. Uh, that's you know, not exactly the same thing as, as carrying out a murder, uh, but it's nonetheless a large scale awful crime. One of the things that worries me a little bit about the sort of seditious, seditious conspiracy wrapper around this is how far that can be extended. I mean, we're already, we're roping in attorneys who are advancing these legal theories or courses of action. Um, you know, the, the sedition charge has been used to prosecute and sentence to decades in prison. Actually, no, there is no sedition charge in any of these cases. Okay, there's a cons but it, okay, so there's a conspiracy charge. There's a there's a, the sure. RICO charge. Okay, and then we can say that you, you know the sedition charge is a separate charge that's been uh, applied to the the January six rioters um, who are now some of them are facing decades in prison. So, some who were not even there. 
I, I'm I'm worried that this approach, this expansive approach, is handing unbounded power to suppress dissent to whichever party controls the state. Should I be worried about that? Uh, I think in this particular set of cases, no. Uh, when you talk about the January 6th people, yes, some of them weren't there, but those who weren't there were ones who were involved in the planning of the attack on the Capitol. They weren't merely people who just said the election was illegitimate or that Trump really won and the like. They were leaders of organizations like the Oath Keepers and the Proud Boys who were directly involved in the planning of the attack. So if you're involved in the planning of a violent action, uh, you can certainly be charged with that, uh, even if you weren't personally present there. Uh, and uh, on the, uh, the breadth of a conspiracy, you know, as I said before, I'm not an expert on RICO, uh, but uh, I, when you're looking at people like Eastman, these were people who are in the inner circle of planners, specifically planning out the specific actions regarding fake electors, uh, rejecting the, uh, you know, the, the plan to have Trump reject the ballots and uh, reject the electoral votes and so forth. So these are not people with some far out indirect connection to the plan. These were essentially the planners themselves. Uh, in the Georgia case, admittedly, I'm not, in, uh, I'm not familiar with all the details of all the indictments of the 18 different people. So perhaps you can find someone among the 18 who was much further removed than Eastman. And if so, we can talk about whether you know, it's a good idea to charge that person or not. But with someone like Eastman and other uh, people closely involved in the planning, I think you know, there's no great slippery slope risk. Indeed, there's a slippery slope risk the other way if you let pe these people get off simply because they're lawyers or the like, uh, because then that creates an obvious incentive to use lawyers to uh, plan your uh, schemes to uh, stay in power. So I want to end on a note uh, that is sure to make our viewers and commenters extra incensed, extra angry. Um, and that is the sort of controversial uh, Section 3 14th Amendment approach to possibly keeping uh, Trump off the ballot in this upcoming election. Um, it essentially uses his role or attempts to use his role in January 6th um, as a means of ensuring that he is kept off the ballot in many states. Uh, Section 3, I believe, was actually something um, that was added in the wake of the Civil War, basically when, you know, the the nation was uh, so terribly divided and then came together after that uh, and was attempting to move on, they're, they're, they felt the need to stipulate uh, that those who had been involved in insurrection or rebellion uh, should be ineligible. Uh, what do you think? I mean, you've supported this pretty publicly, Ilya. Um, what do you make of this, this case? Do you think this is, I, I think there's two questions here. There's, is this prudent to do? And um, is this correct to do? Like there's a pragmatic side and then there's a principle side. How do you look at this? Yeah. So I think there's two sets of issues here. One is whether the legal argument is correct. That issue is sufficiently complicated. There's no way I can do it justice. <laughs> uh, and I have not tried to do it justice. Rather, uh, um, uh, I, if you're interested in this, there's a long and detailed article by Michael Stokes Paulson uh, and Will Bode, two prominent conservative originalist legal scholars who have put out the article in the University of Pennsylvania Law Review, and I urge people who are interested in the legal side of this to look at that. Uh, in my recent Lawfare article, which you just uh, posted, I look at the moral and pragmatic side of this, uh, and uh, I argue there uh, that there are good reasons sometimes to disqualify people from elections in a democracy who are a threat to democracy itself, as proven by their track record. There are parallels from other democracies, particularly in Germany and Eastern Europe. And I also criticize various kinds of slippery slope arguments uh, that have been made against this. But I do admit that some slippery slope considerations should be taken seriously. And I even raise one that uh, I think hasn't been much discussed, which is that uh, the text of the 14th Amendment, Section 3, does not distinguish between insurrections for just causes and insurrections for unjust causes. I think what happened on January 6th is pretty clearly an unjust cause, uh, but this, by the same reasoning would, would disqualify a person who had participated, for instance, in John Brown's insurrection against slavery, at least if that person had been previously a federal or state official. Uh, so uh, while I think there are some reasonable concerns about Section 3 on balance, I think using it is justified in this instance, 
uh, and I weigh out that, those reasons in more detail in the Lawfare article. Uh, and also, does uh, it even count as an insurrection, or is it like a failed insurrection? Right. I mean, yeah, the QAnon sure. shaman was not exactly uh, wondrously effective in his stated goal, yeah. right? So you can have an insur an insurrection can exist even if it fails. Okay, gotcha. uh, there's no requirement that it be successful. Okay, understood. Um, there I are other. I'm sorry, th th there are other questions about whether this counts as an insurrection and those that are addressed very thoroughly in the article by Baud and, uh, and Paulson, uh, but the fact that it failed does not count uh, against its being an insurrection. Indeed, I, I just, uh, the I rebellion like of the that. Confederacy, yeah. which inspired Section 3, also ultimately failed. The Confederacy was crushed, but none that didn't render from being uh, an insurrection. Yeah, I, I just have to ask, Ilya, since what is being proposed here is essentially that states legislate or you know state election officials could pull Trump off the ballot and said he's he's not uh, under the 14th amendment he's not allowed to run here that just strikes me on a on a, a practical level as that is a, a potential tipping point you know people talk about uh, civil war and everything. And I think a lot of that's overblown, but I think the the kind of blowback from that sort of move strikes me as like kind of horrific to contemplate. Does that not worry you? So I think it would be legitimate to worry about this if state officials just do this on their own without any outside review. But in fact, there would be judicial review of decisions like this in both state and potentially federal court as well. Uh, and including, of course, by in the federal courts by judges appointed by Trump and other Republican presidents. I think there's a good chance ultimately this issue would go to the Supreme Court. If the argument is, well, regardless of whether this was done by through courts or not, or regardless of judicial review, that Trump supporters might react with violence, my answer is that the threat of violence uh, should not deter us from doing what is right, if doing this is otherwise right, which I recognize you know, there's an argument about that, but if it's otherwise right to do, if we allow the threat of violence to deter us, then that just incentivizes more violence. Uh, and just as you shouldn't give in to terrorism, you shouldn't give in to uh, uh, threats of violence in this kind of situation either. I am very concerned about the slippery slope argument, but I personally oppose the Section 3 plan with regard to Trump. I'm in favor of it, specifically applied to Vivek Ramaswamy, because I think uh, <laughs> his assault, uh, his insurrection on my earlobes with his Eminem rapping attempts uh, <laughs> definitely means that he ought to be disqualified from being well, on Eminem the Well, Eminem sent a cease and desist letter to him, so uh, you can <laughs> we have write a thank you letter. You can stand Eminem a little bit for that. Yeah, I think we should Section 3 Vivek, uh, not Trump. But uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us, Ilya Soman. Uh, where can people find you? Sure. So they can Google me and find my website. Also, as you mentioned before, the VOLA Conspiracy blog, V-O-L-O-K-H, which is on the Reason website. Wonderful. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. We really appreciated it. Thank you for having me. Great questions. And we'll be back next week. Uh, same time, same place.